Thank you so very, very much to Emma and Stephanie. I've got the great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Rosie Braidotti. Rosie is a distinguished professor in the humanities of Utrecht University and also a founding director of the Center for the Humanities. She was the founding professor of gender studies in Utrecht and is the first scientific director of the Netherlands Research School of Women's Studies. In 0506, she was the Leverton Thrust, um, Trust Visiting Professorship at the Law School of Birkbeck College in London, and she also held the Jean Monnet Visiting Chair at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies in Florence. A very, very warm welcome to Rosie Braidotti. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure, quite an honor to be here. And I would like to thank the two masterminds of this uh, mammoth marathon, Julia Payton Jones and Hans Ulrich Obris, for inviting me and for still being alive, which is quite something. Um, as a social theorist and feminist philosopher, I approached this stand with a certain trepidation for two main reasons. <clears throat> the first one is I fully intend to stick to the 15 minutes of allocated times, which is daunting enough. Secondly, I absolutely brought no visuals. And I expect you at this point to be rather grateful for that and sort of switch off and say, ha, ah, because we've had such a lot of um, high quality, dense material that quite frankly, I am already overdosing um, on images. So I will ask you to switch off your computer, switch on your inner reservoir and, and sort of garderobe and uh, archive of images and do your own projections. If I could do brain scans, I would love to record what you come up with and I would like to be able to store it. And next time I do a talk, I could project your own visualizations of what you think that I may be saying here, but that's for the next marathon on neural aesthetics coming up, I'm sure, in the near future. I have three points to make, and I hope that I make them complicated enough to keep you alive. And those of you who continue to Google and email, good for you, I will do the same. And it is really a set of variations on what I would call the cartographic convulsions of critical theory. The extent to which cartographies, maps, and mappings have been a dominant topos in critical theory, continental philosophy, as a European, when every time I say continental philosophy, my heart sinks, is there any other, would be the question there, but that's for another discussion. The dominant position of mappings and cartographies in critical theory, continental philosophy, since postmodernism. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen, I have done it again, I have pronounced the P word. Every morning when I wake up, I say, today I am not going to pronounce the P word until six o'clock and the first official gin and tonic of the day. <laughs> and every day I break the promise, because although we obviously resolutely live in post-postmodern times, the point of reference, however negative, is there. Since the poor P brigades went down into to history as a form of radical skepticism and moral and cognitive relativism, there is very little that we can do with the P word except mourn its demise and somehow miss it and feel slightly embarrassed that we still have to take our point of reference from it. However, having had the great privilege of being educated at the Sorbonne back in the 1980s by some of the great masters of post-structuralism, I must say that my heart also breaks every time I see the P thing going down the drain and being reduced to moral and cognitive relativism. Because if there's one thing that the P brigades did, that the P generation did, was precisely to suspend the transparency of our relationship to representation, to the idea that maps actually do tell the truth about what is out there without going French because again before 6 p.m. in England anyway going French is always risky think of good old Freddy Fred Jameson in his masterful work on the political economy of meaning the logic of culture in advanced capitalism and the extent to which his cognitive mappings are precisely an attempt to make sense of the convulsive transformations of what we now call advanced capitalism and other sort of mouthful, and never to be pronounced before dinner time, but um, the idea that there, are, there is an isomorphic relationship between psychic processes and social processes, that there is a, a, an intimacy of relation between what we perceive, what we represent, and what is going on out there. Mappings as ways of accessing reality as evident hermeneutical keys by which we can make sense of the convulsive transformations of 
advanced capitalism. And of course, the great connector for the generation of the, posmo, the POMOs, all of them, the great connector is the process of signification itself. This is the generation that has also gone down in history as the linguistic turn. It is language itself that sustains, that cements that relationship, that the isomorphic relationship between psychic and social processes. It's a very interesting, very, very brave, very engaged relationship to the real world out there. How such a movement, POMO, was then reduced to relativism is one of the great scandals of intellectual history and one of those that we're going to have to reread after the frenzy of post-1989 anti-theory is settled if we ever manage to uh, survive it. So the, the fascination with cartography is the centrality of MAPI tells a long story about the difficulties of coming to terms with those processes of change and transformation that are essential to our era. Here comes then my second point. We live in strange times and strange things are happening. Times of ever-expanding yet schizoid waves of change which engender the simultaneous occurrence of contradictory effect, effects. Times of fast-moving changes which do not wipe out the brutality of power relations but quite on the contrary in many ways intensify them and bring them to the point of implosion. Living at such times can be exhilarating or exhausting, but, but the task of representing these changes to ourselves to engage productively with the contradictions, paradoxes and injustices of our time is a perennial challenge. And because of the complexity of coming up with adequate representation of processes of change, I would want to argue that however sick and tired we may be with the P word, we really are stuck with the task of cartographies and mapping. And as Glissant says, and is quoted in the, the catalog in, uh, of this wonderful marathon, we really we need maps, and maps is all that we have. Because the transparency of the relationship between us and reality has forever gone. We are going to be needing more and more exercising of finding adequate representation, negotiating together adequate form of representations for the changes that we are all undergoing. We need cartographies, the terminology comes from Foucault, in the sense of weather maps of shifting power relations, navigational tools in troubled times. And of course, it's one thing to be able to do all such things with technologies and media, but critical theory, philosophy, stuck as they are in the Gutenberg galaxy, stuck as we are with the phallologocentric, another mouthful, pull of a tradition of thought that only has language to, to actually, as the, the means, the tool to clarify the very inconsistency and imprecisions of language, that linguistic circularity really spells enormous challenges for um, critical theory. I became more of a Deleuzean in the course of the 90s as I realized that the only way one could deal with the schizoid logic of advanced capitalism was to suspend the belief in linearity, the belief in objectivity, all those wonderful beliefs um, that they teach you at graduate school, and actually accept that the mix of this, 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 this mixture of changes and contradiction, the simultaneities of contradictory social effects, that, that troublesome double bind in which we've been placed by our own scientific and technological development may also spell the end of a certain tradition of critical theory. And it is not wonder that so much of contemporary critical thought, particularly in the mighty city of London, is now based on premises that I would call dramatically anti-intellectual post-theory. And certainly there's a great deal of post-psychoanalytic, post-Deleuzean uh, critical thought floating around, um, which oversimplifies so much of the great, I would call a symbolic capital of the great tradition of thought that the post-structuralist, the post-modernist um, have embodied and have bequeathed upon us. And I should not name names, but there is a, a, a tendency to reduce a whole generation of thinkers to simplify it and to dismiss it, for instance, as having been so theoretical, so speculative, that they didn't give us a politics, and that real politics has to do with some kick-ass smashing a few heads and then you 
feel so good about it because that's really the political and these great thinkers of the past, Derrida, Deleuze, Irigaray, they didn't give us a politics, they only gave us further complexities and real politics has something to do with the return of proper Leninism, of proper something proper which has to do with violence, which has to do with sort of revengeful narcissistic masculinity, triumphant in its determination to submit once again the cultural to their own vision of the political. In opposition to this, and that is the last point because I did say I was going to make it in 15 minutes, I would like to then look at how we could turn critical theory around into something that would be more affirmative and in that respect reconnect to what I would consider the rigorous conceptual passions that motivated that rhizomic uh, uh, sort of revolutionary subversive way of thinking about our necessity to engage with the present. So critique, uh, critique as creation, and I could talk for six months about it but I will not, is the last point. We have started with the difficulties of devising adequate cartographies for our complex times. All you have to do is read the catalog for this marathon and you will get a beautiful analysis of advanced capitalism. It's a system that engenders and multiplies differences for the sake of commodification. It's a schizoid system that propels you in all directions, that confuses the relationship between margin and center by dislocating what used to be the dialectical link between self and other. It's a process that engenders sexualization, generalizations, racialization, naturalizations without a direct relationship to the empirical reference that used to be the carrier of those processes. It is a system that actually, if, if I were to quote um, Deleuze, requoted by Zizek, it's a system that um, promotes feminism without women, racism without races, natural laws without nature, reproduction without sex, sexuality without genders, multiculturalism without ending racism, economic growth without development, cash flow without money. Late capitalism also produces fat-free ice creams, alcohol-free beer, next to genetically modified health food, companion species alongside computer viruses, new animal and human immunity breakdowns and deficiencies, new epidemics, new diseases, and increased longevity of those who are lucky enough to inhabit the overdeveloped so-called advanced world. Welcome to capitalism and schizophrenia. If this is, it's a straight quote from the Lesson Batari, if this is the case then, how do we engage with the times? How can we be worthy of our times? And this is a citation from Spinoza, picked up from that masterpiece of 20th century philosophy that is the Thousand Plateaus of the Lesson Guattari. How can we be worthy of the times while resisting the times? How can we engage with the present because this is all we have because all ideological, teleological future visions have completely let us down and have absolutely hit bottom line. The present is all we have. How do we engage with the present in the mode of resistance without falling into the negativity that is so central to so much critical theory, especially today? How do we become worthy of the times, not in the mode of passive acquiescence, but on the contrary, by undertaking the business of critical theory as the active engagement in the creation of alternatives, of substantial, powerful alternatives, by undertaking the business of critical theory as the active engagement in the creation of alternatives, of substantial, powerful alternatives. The transformation of negativity into affirmation, which is key to the Spinozist ethics, and here there's a whole discussion on the switch on political ontology, from the Hegelian paradigm to the Spinozist, more vitalist, more monistic ontology, that switch, the transformation of negativity into positive, affirmative forms of engagement with the present uh, is something that for philosophy is immensely difficult. And one of the great lessons that my teacher Deleuze bequeathed upon us is the necessity of running parallel experiments between philosophy, science and the arts, of which this marathon is an eminent example, running parallel experiments to try to reconnect across these different genres 
to find ways in which our engagement with the present in the mode of active engagement, resistance without negativity, can reconstruct a sort of intimacy between us and the world in which we live, can reconnect us to the roots of our belonging to this goddamn system that drives us crazy, because it is ours, it is the effect of our own science and technology, to be engaged in the affirmative mode so that we can actually attempt to make a difference in a mode not only of, of generosity towards future generation, intergenerational justice is a very important issue here, but also more importantly, importantly for something that I would call gratuitness, something that is purely gratuitous, something that would make us able to engage critically for what Hannah Arendt used to call love of the world and that I call on a good day just for the hell of it. Thank you very much.